Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Aaron Blade and I'm the editor, creator, and producer of what you're watching right now, Blade Talk. If you are new here, welcome and you found this presentation helpful and informative, do me a huge favor and hit that like button. Do me an even greater favor and subscribe to my channel. I always appreciate all the support that I am given. So, first of all, I just want to say thank you for all of you helping me get above um, 1,000 subscribers so thank you so much it truly means a lot to me I'm on the road to 2,000 all right my goal as always is to be the um, largest black conservative Jew on this platform all right and with your help I think we're making it happen all right so thank you all so much um Right off the top, I want to uh, answer the obvious question and say, yes, I'm going to do um, a presentation on the Enlightenment from a Jewish perspective. So please um, subscribe so you get notified when I post that. But for today, it is that time again for me to answer some questions from you all. Um, so you already know how this goes. And again, thank you all for the support. Thank you for all those that submitted questions um, on my comment feed, on my email. Thank you all so much uh, for helping me be interactive with you all. So that being said, let's hit that intro and let's begin. All right, so here we are. Let's jump right into some questions, all right? First question, hey Blade, when will the Mashiach come? Thank you for all you do. Congrats on 1,000 subscribers. All right, um, so obviously I can't say, right? Only Hakoda Shaboraku knows. Um, what I can tell you is what I believe, okay? I don't think the Mashiach is coming for a long time. All right. Not in my lifetime, nor in the lifetime of my great, great grandchildren. OK, um, tradition teaches that the Mashiach is going to come at a time of tremendous upheaval. And contrary to what you see on the news, I don't think that we're there. Right. Yes, atrocities have happened and I definitely don't want to make light of it. But the way that human consciousness is shifting i believe that we're trending on a good path okay we are taking mental health seriously we are condemning bullies right we are valuing life you know we're pushing for uh, equal rights for all respecting um every human being right so i think we're on a on a good path okay um people don't even want to enlist in the military all around the world because they don't believe in war anymore right so when you look at the jewish people's history okay outside of the fact of when we first entered the holy land has there ever been a better time to be jewish seriously ask yourself has there ever been a better time to be jewish the country's and the Middle East, um, for the most part, are recognizing Israel now. As a matter of fact, uh, the travesty that happened on October 7, 2023, um, took place because Israel was going to meet with um, Saudi Arabia and they were going to sign peace accords and Saudi Arabia was going to recognize uh, Israel. So Iran, of course, um, Hamas is a proxy of Iran, uh, wanted to create a distraction uh, so Saudi Arabia wouldn't sign the agreement. Thus, October 7th happened, right? There are a few countries that are extremists, Lebanon, uh, Iran, um, etc., that, you know, refuse to get on board and they don't want to essentially recognize uh, Israel's existence. But most of the, P most of the countries in uh, the Middle East are starting to come around Egypt, Saudi Arabia, um, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So if the tradition is true and the Mashiach will come during tremendous upheaval, then I don't believe that we're living in that age. Okay. Now, when the United States of America falls, 
uh, World War III breaks out, especially with uh, nuclear weapons now in play, you know, um, when we don't value life anymore, etc., then I will say that Mashiach is near, okay? If, however, you believe that the Mashiach will come when things are going well in the world, then I would say that we should see the Mashiach within a few generations, right? I just don't buy into the notion that the world is on fire. The world is going to hell, and I don't know what's happening. There is no saving it, etc., etc. People who say that really don't know history, okay? When I mean, people back in the day would you know sell their children into slavery uh the horrors that the mentally disabled went through um the lobotomies and um you know the lack of respect for women um i'm black so the trials and tribulations that black people have went through um you know the cold war in the 1960s when we came this close to nuclear annihilation the holocaust we again we just aren't there right again i know that we have um a crisis and and things aren't perfect okay not making light of you know the the travesties that have occurred um but you know you can see that mankind is um essentially pushing for you know, everyone to be treated equally, right? So, you know, regardless to what you believe, your disability, your gender, your skin complexion, etc., right? Things are still happening in certain uh, extremist Muslim countries that are horrible towards women, you know, and others, but this isn't on a global scale, okay? And some are even, uh, some women are even rising up against the misogynistic regimes, right? Um, there are women that are speaking out to let the world know what they're going through. You know, more nations are joining NATO. And one of the conditions to join NATO is to treat their, ch their citizens um, with respect and establish a democracy. So for me, if the tradition holds true that the Mashiach will come during a tremendous upheaval, I don't see it, right? There's never been a better time to be a woman. There's never been a better time to be black. There's never been a better time to uh, have a mental uh, disability or disability period, um, a learning disability, etc. People are starting to care more, empathize more, right? Again, if you turn on the news, they know that drama sells. They know that the the bad stories sell, okay? That's one of the reasons why racism will never die out right because and the news it's a business right and they know that they'll get more clicks and more money if they show something bad right so if you watch a news cycle you'll see you know this you know uh, travesty happened and this murder took place and this kidnapping etc etc and then the last 45 seconds they'll tell you about something good because they know that the bad stuff sells right and they don't care what that does to people's uh, perception right creating uh, anxiety depression etc etc they don't care about that they only care about the bottom dollar right but I think that mankind is trending to a better place. I honestly believe that, right? And, you know, but you wouldn't know it again from watching the news, all right? Um, and again, I'm not saying that everything is perfect. It absolutely isn't, okay? But we are definitely... You know, if you go back to the ancient world, the Middle Ages, and where people wouldn't value life, women, you know, there was no such thing as a democracy when people had a say so and, you know, who would uh, run the government and whatnot, you know, 
I mean, it, it was a horrible time. There's no better time to be Jewish than right now. There's no better time to be black than right now, to be a woman than right now. And I think that we're trending in a better direction. Okay, hope that answers the question. What is a common misconception about conservative Judaism? So a common misconception is that we are Orthodox light, okay? Um, or we are basically reform, okay? Some try to push conservative Jews into one of the two extremes, all right? As a conservative Jew, I reject this idea, okay? We are individuals with different beliefs, all right? We are open to interpretation, but we are anchored by Torah and Halakha, okay? And that is so we don't drift too far. To me, this most accurately reflects uh, reflects Jewish history. Okay, we can debate, we can compromise, we can disagree, or whatever. But I will not strip you of your identity as a Jew if I don't see things your way. Okay, I love that. I absolutely love that in the conservative movement. Okay, I believe the Torah is divine. My rabbi, my rabbi. Um, doesn't he believes that uh the torah is uh, man-made it, it was a collection of stories made by jews and there was very little um divine uh presence inside of it right so we disagree but we can agree agree to disagree and still hold the torah in high regard and follow it to the best of our ability all right i don't believe that rabbis should officiate at interfaith uh, weddings but there are some conservative jews that believe that they should right and if they give a an halakhic reason as to why they should then the rabbinical assembly will allow it right we give our arguments and we can agree to disagree but we walk away still conservative jews all right that's what i love about being a conservative jew okay now, in Orthodox, if you believe that, you know, women can be rabbis, you can use electricity on Shabbat, your entire identity may be stripped from you, especially if you're a convert, because the Orthodox movement have taken upon themselves to nullify conversions, okay? Now, this is nowhere in Jewish law that anyone has the right to do that, but the Orthodox movement um, makes a point that if you don't follow and continue the orthodox path then they will strip that from you right they aren't jews anymore and reform is on the opposite end of the spectrum if you don't believe in same-sex marriage if you don't support the lgbtq community or believe that women can be rabbis then they will tell you that you're backwards thinking right or you're stuck in the 1800s right and you basically essentially aren't reform you know, you need to go somewhere else. It's very hard to make friends if, you know, let's say you're on the political right and you're a reform Jew, right? The conservative path I define as the middle of the road. And the funny thing about the middle of the road is it's the widest part of the road, right? So there's more uh, openness for uh, interpretation, um, exchange of ideas, things like that, right? So for me, um, conservative Judaism isn't orthodox light, right? It started out as an orthodox movement, actually. Um, JTS was originally an orthodox yeshiva, so it does have its roots kind of in uh, orthodoxy, right? And at the same time, we're not reform, right? We see Jewish law as binding. And we view changes that appear in our society through the lens of Torah. And we make decisions based on that, right? So for me, um, the biggest misconception is Orthodox Jews trying to claim that we're basically reform and reform Jews trying to make the claim that conservative Judaism is basically modern orthodox right or orthodox light you know so that that to me would be uh, the biggest misconception about conservative judaism we are our own um we stand on our own 
right? And we have different um, interpretations and belief systems within it. And regardless to whether we agree or disagree, we walk away still holding on to our Jewish identity. Hope that answers the question. Next question, what can a reform convert say if an Orthodox Jew tells them they aren't Jewish because it wasn't Orthodox? I would say find me in Jewish law where it says that and they will have a hard time doing so. Find me in Jewish law. Give me the specific source of where it says if I don't have an Orthodox conversion, my conversion is not valid. Okay. Okay. I will remind them that you converted under Jewish law, okay? There's no such thing as a universal conversion, okay? Conversion within the Orthodox movement has become so political, you know, someone, an Orthodox rabbi can convert you and someone next state over may not even recognize it. And the rabbi new in Israel definitely may not recognize it because they only have a certain list called the Atim list that they actually recognize, right? And they have the power to nullify conversions at the same time. So, you know, I mean, you may be Jewish today and non-Jewish tomorrow, right? So to me, uh, don't let anyone strip you of your identity, okay? The Orthodox movement, um, some, not all, want to be the gatekeeper of Judaism, and that won't happen, Okay, the numbers show this, so they try to sell people on the fact that it's the only authentic way to be Jewish. Okay, no movement today is more than 200 years old. All right, and that sounds weird to my ears anyway, because anytime anyone says there's only one way to um, believe in something or practice a certain ideology, that just tells me that you want to control something that's out of your control, okay? And I see that not just in the Jewish world, but in the black community as well, right? If I believe in, you know, something politically, right, that the mass, uh, the majority of black people don't agree with, then all of a sudden you're, you're a coon, you're, um, you're not really black, you're this, and they try to attack your character. They try to attack and strip you of your identity, Okay, and at that point, you know, to me, um, it it actually, um, I draw inspiration out of that because that lets me know that I'm thinking for myself. Okay, and they and the people that aren't thinking for themselves are going to attack the people that are, are thinking for themselves because it makes them look good in front of their friends. Okay, so, you know, we're not... Uh, meant to do Jewish the same. That is my personal belief, okay? This is part of our punishment while we're in exile, okay? Only the Mashiach will guide us and bring us all together. And even then, I don't think that um, being Jewish is going to uh, be practiced the same way in every household, right? We'll have the major, um, the major commonalities or similarities, observing Shabbat, um, the uh, pilgrimage holidays, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you know how we do Jewish is going to be on a community by community basis, right? And I love that because I personally believe that God wants diversity. You know, as we, you know, um, as we uh, progress, right? There are twelve tribes of Israel. Do you think every last one of them practiced Judaism the same exact way? Every last one of them, right? You know, um, we went to the Holy Land and there was a civil war that broke out, okay? The country split into the northern kingdom of Israel and the south, uh, the south, which was the uh, kingdom of Judah, right? And we were sent dozens of prophets and not one prophet came and said, hey, we all need to get back and do Jewish one way. We all need to form this country again and be one country again, etc., etc. No, what they did was they said we need to get back to Torah. And we need to get back to God. Okay. So, um, you know, tradition even says that when the Torah was given, um, many people heard different things based on our individual understanding. 
Okay. So to go back to your question, ask them, you know, if they believe in the Rambam. 98% of religious Jews do. Okay. He is a huge authority figure and let them know that the Rambam stated that you need three things in order for your conversion to be valid. Okay. Torah, Brismillah, and Mikvah. Okay. If you have these three, then you are Jewish. Okay. One, you have to have the Torah and accept the Torah upon yourself. Okay. Accept the Torah. Two, if you're a male, you have to have a ritual circumcision, a brit milah. Okay. If you already are circumcised, then you need to have what's called a hatafat dam brit. Okay. And then third, you need a mikvah, a natural body of water to submerge yourself in. If you have those three things, you are Jewish according to the Rambam, according to the Mishnah Torah, and according to the Shukhan Aruch. Okay? Period. Hope that answers the question. Next question, why is Shabbat more holy than the days of creation? So, Shabbat is more important because it separates us from any other creation, okay? That is why it's so sacred. God ceased from creating, so we take time to cease or stop as well, okay? We live in a, uh, live life in a realm of space, okay? Constantly going places, making things, buying things, fixing things, etc., right? We have to focus on the physical world on a day-to-day -day basis. We got to make a living after all, right? Shabbat is a maneuver from the realm of space into the realm of time okay and we're the only creation that can do it letting go of you know going places making things etc it's hard to unplug yourself from social media emails etc but that's the whole point right that's the whole idea is to uh set aside aside time for things that are important it creates um balance or rhythm right it creates a rhythm to life with the seventh note being rest or breathe right it not only connects you to god but it connects you to yourself and you know to uh the jewish people as a whole okay consider this we are the only creation that can cease from creating we're the only creation that can cease from creating imagine if the sun took a one day off out of the week Okay, imagine if the earth stopped rotating on its axis one day out of the week. Okay, uh, a lion decided it wasn't going to uh, protect its pride one day out of the week. All right, it would cause mayhem. Right, we as humans have the ability to rest and thus we reconnect with um, things that are important God, family, uh, community, etc. And time these times we actually need that. I encourage that 100%. Okay, you know, imagine if the if the earth took a rest and said, I'm, I'm not gonna spend today, okay, you know, and instead I'm gonna go chill with the other planets, okay, that would cause a major um, conundrum for um, all the living creatures living on earth right so you know shabbat is sacred because it, we can set aside time to focus on things that are more important unplug yourself some, from social media okay things that it does to you know your mind and how it um how it breeds group thinking okay unplug yourself okay so you maintain your individual identity okay hope that answers the question next question what's wrong with the dating world in your opinion <laughs> so in my opinion What's wrong with the dating world is people are cowards, okay, and have unrealistic expectations, okay? We all got baggage or went through something that still haunts us, and most people don't want to be transparent about their issues from the beginning, from the get-go, okay? We force the other person to learn them on their own so no one trusts no one because I know you got stuff in your closet and you aren't giving me any of it. I know you got baggage. We all do, right? So because I have to study you and I don't know how long I'm going to have to study you, I am going to hold my feelings back for as long as I can, okay? And for that same reason, we like to keep something, you know, on the side as well, 
right? In case things don't work out, okay? I need something to fall back on, that sort of mentality, okay? Here's the thing. If you got something on the side, then there's no way that you can fully be committed to dating, all right? There's no way. It stems from trauma, and I will ask a basic question, okay? How can you fully love if you are too afraid of getting hurt? How can you fully love if you're too afraid of getting hurt? And if you can't fully love because you're too afraid of getting hurt, you have no business dating in the first place. Okay? See, what you might mistake for love is actually psychologically a psychologically unhealthy attach, attachment or addiction uh, for someone else's uh, presence in your life to validate you, okay? And I'll say this from a man's point of view. Make sure you know how that man feels about women, and there is no way, better way to find that out than to ask him how he feels about his mother, okay? So, uh, last point I'll make is... Don't make the mistake of so many people who look for a man or a woman that they have something in common with, okay? We both are in the same career field. We both watch the same shows. We both listen to the same music. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. That's superficial. You need to find, you need to make sure that the other person has the same values, Okay, that's what builds the foundation that, that you can build off of, you know, and have a healthy relationship, the values. Okay, um, for example, you like to save money. They like to spend money. How is that relationship going to work? Right. That's just a disaster waiting to happen. You want children. The other person don't want children. How is that relationship going to work? Right. You believe in a relationship with God. The other person doesn't believe in God or doesn't or isn't really concerned with their relationship with God. How's that relationship going to work? Right? You believe in saving for retirement. They believe in living for today. How is that relationship going to work? Okay, study that person's values and make sure you can live with those values and understand something. You cannot change anyone. Okay, you can't change anyone. All right, that's the big mistake that a lot of people make. Okay, their values, who they are at their core, that's never going away. All right, hope that answers the question. Next question, do you believe the Kabbalah was given at Mount Sinai? Um, honestly, no, I don't. And that's one of the areas that I disagree with Chabad on, right? And we have to be very careful what we say is attributed to God at Mount Sinai, okay? I believe that the Torah was revealed from God at Mount Sinai as well as the Oral Torah. And the reason I say the Oral Torah is because the written Torah is too vague for there not to be an explanation, okay? The Torah says that the secret things are for God, Okay, that which is revealed are for us to follow. Okay, again, I'm not in need of a spiritual explanation. Okay, it kills me when people even claim, you know, you ask someone, you know, what religion are you? And they say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm more spiritual as if they know about the spirit realm. They know what a soul contains or anything about the spirit realm whatsoever. They don't know, right? They're actually not answering the question. We live in a physical world and I need to know where you get your values and your morals from. And you telling me that you're spiritual doesn't answer that. It's not telling me where you are deriving your uh, sense of morality from, okay? I think Kabbalah is good to study, but I don't believe that it is divine. Actually, I think some parts of it um, has bigoted ideas, okay, and creates this superiority complex, okay? And it's why some people think that Jews are, you know, think that we're better than non-Jews and, you know, which ultimately can lead to anti-Semitism, right? Because of the Kabbalah, because, you know, imagine this, 
You have two newborn babies in front of you. One is Jewish and the other isn't. Okay. But the Kabbalah states that because the Jewish baby has a Jewish soul, that baby is superior to the non-Jewish baby. Do you like the sound of that? Does that make sense to you? Then they come up with the idea that if you convert to Judaism, that's because you have a, you have a Jewish soul um, and you're really just coming back to where you're supposed to be. Okay, I reject that notion as well because I believe that all souls are created equal. Okay, and it is the circumstances of one's birth is irrelevant. It's what you do with the gift of life that determines who you are. Okay, If you choose to convert to Judaism and accept more responsibilities upon yourself in an effort to get close to God, a close relationship with God, that's because you chose it. I don't believe that it has anything. Oh, my soul and the universe and the, the stars align perfectly. And so I was destined to No, we can rise above our nature. We can rise above, you know, our abilities and achieve greatness. And the more you attribute this to your soul or your spirit and whatnot, then the less it takes away from your individual ability to achieve greatness. And that's why I reject it. Okay. Um, and it isn't like if you don't, um, you know, convert to Judaism, that God loves you any less. All right. Imagine you have two children. One is a doctor. One is a cashier at your local convenience store. Do you love one child over the other? No, they just have different responsibilities, but you love both of your children equally. Right. And I reject the notion that, um, again, if you do more mitzvot, then that means that you're better than the next person. Right. Because it all matters on where you're trending on this channel. I challenge people to be better than who they were yesterday or who they were last year. Okay. So, and, and let the Torah be your guide. Okay. Our job on this earth is not to be perfect. Okay. But to be the best version of ourselves and to utilize our gift to help other people. Okay. So I won't sit here and say that an Orthodox Jew that is Shomer Shabbat is better than a reformed Jew that isn't, okay? If you have an Orthodox Jew that observes Shabbat according to their interpretation, so they don't cook, they don't drive, they don't use electricity, etc., then that's amazing. But I'm not going to say that they're better than the reformed Jew who needs to make a living so they may tune in to service or something, light a candle, but then they got to go to work to uh, provide for their family. I'm not prepared to do that, right? People's circumstances are different, right? So for me, I reject the superiority. And that's, again, one of the things that I think that fuels anti-Semitism as well. The idea that we are better. Okay, um, we accept upon ourselves more responsibilities and it's our job to teach people a way to get closer to God through accepting more responsibility and thus bring out the very best of everyone. That's what I believe that we are supposed to do on this earth. Instead of treating them as if, you know, they're just chopped liver, right? They're just, you know, um, they don't matter, essentially. Because that's what Kabbalah essentially establishes that, you know, Jews, we have our laws and non-Jews, they have their laws and the two need to say separate it, right? No, if there are some, you know, non-Jews that want to gain a close relationship with God, then they have the ability to do that, right? 
and I don't believe that it uh, well it's because yeah you're yeah like the the mystical you know tradition and the stars are aligning this, this is where this is where you're supposed to be no they just they made a decision and I'm going to credit them with making that decision rather than it's because your soul and and you know the the spirit realm and I don't buy into that the secret things are for God okay so the Kabbalah introduces this notion of fate and essentially no matter what you do it's already written in the stars or the heavens or whatever anyway so it's actually depressing right because you're basically telling me that I'm not in control of my life I shouldn't get credit for the effort that I put in right so yeah, personally, you know, I think that the Kabbalah has some some bigoted ideas. I want to teach Torah to everyone. And those that accept it upon themselves and want to take on themselves more responsibilities in an effort to get close to God. That's amazing. That's awesome. But it's welcome to everyone. Right? So that's my personal feelings on Kabbalah. Okay. There were some other um, great questions that I can, I think I can remember off the top of my head. Um, uh, what's my favorite scary movie? Um, the paranormal activities uh, really get me. You know what I mean? Um, it, those, those scare me just a tad. Um, there was another one. Um, have women always been counted in a minion? Um, there's nothing in the Talmud that says the woman can't be counted in a minion. Okay, let's get that point out. And for people that's like women have never been counted in a minion, that's because women didn't go to synagogues very often right so why do people go to synagogues because sometimes you know there's a mourner, mourner's cottage that needs to be re uh, recited and you need a group of individuals to do so right so that per that person that's mourning doesn't feel like they're alone right so people would go to synagogue to make sure that they can be counted so that you know the person that is mourning don't feel you know alone but the idea um that women um shouldn't be counted in a minion there's no talmudic text that i know of that says so at all there's nothing in the talmud that says a woman can't be counted in a minion um, there was another question, um, can a Noahide, um, marry someone of a different, uh, belief system? Um, it depends on what that belief system is. You know, all faiths and religions are not created equal. Okay. There are some people that are pushing the, you know, well, there's God and, you know, the Jewish God and the Christian God and it is, you know, the Muslim God, we all want the same thing and, and we don't. And we don't. There are some that, that try to push this notion and I reject it completely because the only way that you know that you are serving the God of Israel is you have to look at what said God expects from you. What does that God expect from you? Okay. And if the expectations are different, then you can safely assume that the the um gods are, that are not the same at all the god of israel wants you to live according to his torah right the torah that he revealed the islamic god stated that the torah has been corrupted now the god of israel said you shall follow this torah throughout your generations for as long as you walk the earth okay the islamic god says you don't have to follow it anymore because it's been corrupted and you have to accept Muhammad as the last and final messenger. Well, that contradicts what the God of Israel stated. The Christian God says that Jesus 
is the fulfillment of the law. So we don't have to follow it anymore. But there's nothing, there's 613 laws, 613 commandments, not one, not one says that there will be someone that comes and fulfills all the laws. You can't even fulfill all the law. You can't, you can't fulfill 613 laws. So that whole premise just doesn't make sense to me. There are some laws for men, some for children, some for elders, some for priests, some for, you know, women. And you're going to tell me that Jesus was all of the, he was a woman, he was a priest, he was a child, he was a man, he was, he was everything wrapped up into one. No, no. So it's clear that the Christian God and the God of Israel can't be the same God. Okay, not the way that they understand, especially the introduction of a trinity, a triune God, etc. No, no. So, again, I reject that premise. Make sure that you identify what that person believes. And again, don't accept the idea that, well, you know, I'm more spiritual. No, that doesn't tell me anything. You're trying to avoid the question. All right, that doesn't tell me where you draw your uh, your basis of morality from, right? So don't buy into that. And there was another question, can Anul Hyde um, read the Talmud, right? I would say yes, but with a rabbi, okay? Or a knowledgeable Jew that can explain what you're reading. It's very easy to get lost inside the Talmud, Okay, is a lot of people, um, especially people that want to debate Jews and whatnot. Um, some Muslims, some Christians, that, oh, it says it in the Talmud. It says this and this, and and that's the law. And no, it's not. It's a discussion that they're having. It's a discussion amongst the rabbis. Nobody's claiming that that rabbi that those words are from God. These are discussions. And it teaches us how to have discussions, how to have debates, right? So some people like to pull uh, quotations from the Talmud and think that it's from God. And they, it, it's no, no. So, um, you know, be mindful um, of that. Um, I think there was another um, question about... Um, what crime did uh, Jesus commit, according to the Jews? Um, you know, Jesus led, when you claim to be the Messiah at those times, okay, the Messiah was understood to be the king of the Jews, okay? Now, Rome, who was a, um, a brutal empire, right and we were under that empire's uh, control essentially anytime you say that there is a king well that offends the emperor and they don't take kindly to that all right so what jesus did was a um, treasonous offense to the roman empire but again as i've stated the New Testament was written during the time of the Roman Empire. So, of course, they absolved themselves of any wrongdoing. You know, you have Pontius Pilate, who's a vicious anti-Semite, that says that I see no fault with this man. He's innocent, etc., etc. And we know that Pontius Pilate was recalled back to Rome because of his barbarianism towards the Jews. He would kill a Jew when it didn't matter. Right? He'd kill a Jew because he, he felt like it. But the Roman Empire succeeds in doing the most damage to the Jewish people because they succeed in rewriting history. Right? When you take, you know, because the Jews led a revolt against the Romans and they ultimately lost, the Romans kicked them out of the land. They brought in other people and they renamed the land Syria Palestina. And so now you have a bunch of people claiming that they're um, from Palestine and this is the area that didn't even exist. Right? There is no um, independent declaration or declaration of independence of 
Palestine doesn't exist. Right? The Romans did this to essentially, you know, try to erase us of our history. Right? And in the New Testament, as I've stated, there are hints of anti-Semitism in it because you, um, they wrote or they approved what went into the New Testament and they made sure that you're not going to say anything negative about the Roman Empire. And so the blame gets shifted to the Jews. And so now you have the Jews saying that we're begged, we begged Pontius Pilate and we pleaded that you have to kill him, right? You had not let the blood be on our hands and the hands of our children, et cetera, et cetera. All right? Really? And Pontius Pilate, who was a vicious anti-Semite, didn't want anything to do with killing an innocent Jew, even though he killed thousands and was so murderous that he was recalled back to Rome. He lost his job for killing so many Jews. Okay. Jesus's, um, Jesus's flaw was we were living under a brutal empire and he was claiming to be a king, which is a treasonous offense. And in terms of, you know, the Jewish realm, he was um, claiming to be God or a son of God, right? And um, he also, you know, messed up things in the temple, you know, overturned things and, and whatnot. And you just, you know, can't sit up here and exhibit that kind of behavior, right? And calling Jews, you know, an evil, adulterous uh, generation, and you want to get mad at every um, every Jew that questions you that actually has knowledge, right? So now it makes everybody um, have this idea that the Jews wanted to cause problems. So they kept questioning. We questioned every prophet. We questioned Moses, right? So what makes Jesus so special, right? So, you know, that and, you know, among other things, right? Jesus was a teacher and he went to um, people that weren't really knowledgeable and he was a good teacher. I believe that the, the real Jesus actually brought people to the Torah, right? And tried to lead a political uh, revolt against the Romans and they killed him. And that movement almost died out until Paul had a vision on the road to Damascus where he supposedly met Jesus 35 years after, after Jesus had already departed from this earth, right? And Paul, who stated he was a Pharisee. I don't even believe he was Jewish, to be honest with you. I don't believe that he was a Pharisee, and I don't even believe he was Jewish. As a matter of fact, Corinthians says, you know, it displays his motive clear as day. As to the Jews, I appear as a Jew. To those under the law, I appear as someone under the law. To the non-Jews, I appear as a non-Jew. He was willing to be a chameleon and morph himself into anyone that he was talking to in order to get his message across. That, to me, is the most blunt statement that, that Paul has ever said that lets me know that I need to stay away from this guy. Because that is manipulation at its finest. Why can't you just be yourself? If what you have is the truth, why can't you just be yourself? I'm not on this platform saying, you know, to the Christians, I'm a Christian. To the Muslims, I'm a Muslim. And to the atheists, I'll be an atheist. No, I'm, I'm just going to be myself. And my words are going to stand on their own. All right? So if you read the New Testament, he tells you clear as day what his motives are. Right. So 
that's it for uh, this question and answer session. I hope I answered all of your questions to the best of my ability. Thank you all so much again for getting me over the hump of a thousand subscribers. It really means a lot to me. Thank you all so much. Um, if you found this presentation helpful, informative, do me a huge favor and hit that like button. Do me an even greater favor and subscribe to my channel. I always appreciate all the support that I am given. Thank you all so much. Be good to yourselves. Be good to others. Until the next episode, y'all take care.